My name's Colin, I'm a junior doctor working in the UK. Fairly recently I was asked to do a teaching session on what was essentially going to be a guide for F3 doctors taking an F3 year, something I've discussed quite a lot previously on this channel. Seeing as I put quite a lot of time and effort into the teaching session and I went into quite a bit of detail, I thought I'd try and turn it into a video as well. So in this video I'm going to discuss a brief history of the foundation training programme and the F3 year essentially. And I think it's important because if you don't fully understand the idea of an F3 year or an F3 doctor, it's difficult to get the most out of this year. I'll also discuss why doctors are typically choosing to take time away from training, then I'll talk about some of the different job roles available to F3 doctors, before I finally cover some generalised tips and tricks for taking an F3 year. So yeah, here's my guide to taking an F3 year after you've finished your foundation training. So let's start with the history lesson then. Back in 2002, when I was still in primary school, Chief Medical Officer Sir Liam Donaldson essentially set out an aim to make a lot of changes to the way doctors are trained in the UK. Basically, he was concerned that doctors were working unsupervised, especially at junior levels, and not really on a sort of formalised training programme. Essentially, they were doing ill-defined roles as SHOs, and they just kept doing these roles until they built up enough clinical experience to then apply for specialty training. But there was no set curriculum, there was no sort of structured day-to-day -day teaching for these doctors. It was just a sort of case of they would apply for SHO job, keep applying for different jobs until they felt comfortable or confident in applying for specialty training. And this, as I said before, this on-the-job learning was considered unsupervised and there was no curriculum attached to that. And that's where Sir Liam Donaldson was concerned, because in particular, those who'd recently just graduated, so essentially FY once nowadays, he felt needed extra support and help integrating within the NHS. He didn't want doctors finishing medical school and basically being left to their own devices as they worked and gained enough experience within the NHS to then apply for specialty training. And he wanted to ensure that these doctors, these postgraduate doctors, were receiving formalised teaching in the form of classroom teaching sessions as part of some organised teaching program. Eventually this essentially led to the creation of the foundation training program. In theory this was to ensure that doctors received appropriate support while starting work as a doctor whilst also enable them to get a wide range of skills and competencies that'd be applicable to a wide range of specialty training programs. The foundation training program was the first time that newly qualified doctors had a set curriculum which enabled them to demonstrate a level of competence or completion of the foundation program. As I said before, previously there had been no national curriculum so doctors had a wide range of skills but they had no formalised way of showing this. And the foundation training program was thought to be more inclusive of academia and clinical placements which were taking part in the community as well. And it also was thought that having foundation doctors on rotation would help basically provide a workforce for specialties which were undersubscribed, for example psychiatry. So if you put foundation doctors on psychiatry placements, it was thought it would help having more doctors in these placements because then they'd gain more experience and they'd be more likely to apply for these specialties. Basically by exposing doctors to psychiatry, again I'll use this as an example, they were more likely to apply to those specialty training programs. Same with GP for example, that was another one that got used quite a bit. There was something that's also important to point out was Sir Liam Donaldson's primary aim, which was put in the unfinished business report, and I'll quote it, was after completion of the foundation program, doctors should enter a basic specialist training program providing a breadth of education and training. Essentially, he didn't want F3 doctors. That was kind of what was happening before. What he wanted was foundation doctors to gain the experience they needed in the foundation training program to then go directly into specialty training. Another quote he said was, it will not be acceptable for individual trainees to spend significant periods as SHOs beyond that necessary to complete the stage of training. Basically, he wanted doctors to go from foundation training directly into specialty training and not have this interim period working as F3 doctors. Obviously, we now know that hasn't quite worked out like that. And there's groups of doctors, lots of doctors, the majority of doctors now, going from foundation training into the sort of ether of the F3 year before many then go on to apply to specialty training. This all came out about 20 years ago and as I've just discussed, it didn't quite work out the way that he wanted it to. And as you can see by this graph, I'm sure you've seen it before, more and more doctors, as I've just mentioned, are choosing to go from foundation training program, F3 year random jobs, whatever you want to call it, into specialty training, but there's this big gap and it's getting more and more popular for doctors to take time from the foundation training program to go into this gap before applying to specialty training. Now the reason I wanted to raise this as an issue was, basically, the foundation training program was supposed to provide you with a broad range of competencies that would enable you to go directly into specialty training. But if more and more doctors are choosing to take time away from training before then going on to applying to specialty training, is the foundation training program really meeting their needs? And arguably, I think that's a good question to start thinking about 
if you are planning on taking an F3 year. What can you get from taking an F3 year that you haven't got from the foundation training program? What are you hoping to get out of the year? There's no point in taking an F3 year if you don't really have much of an aim about what you're trying to get out of it. And don't get me wrong, it could be something really simple. It could be like, I want to take time away from working as a doctor. It's completely legitimate perfect good reason to take an F3 year. Or it could be I want to earn a bit more money, or it could be I want to get this experience in this specific specialty that I didn't have the opportunity to do as a foundation trainee. These are all legitimate reasons for taking an F3 year. And at the end of the day, everyone's reason for taking an F3 year is going to be unique to them, and that's completely understandable. But if you are taking an F3 year, start to think about why you specifically are choosing to take that time away from training. Following on from that, why do doctors take time away from training? And as I said, they're likely unique to each doctor, but I'll go through some of the more common reasons that doctors have previously given, and some of the reasons that I've myself have chosen to take time away from training for applying specialty training. Number one reason, flexibility. As a foundation doctor, you're stuck to a rota, you have no control over when you're working, when you're not working, and even when you're trying to take annual leave, it can be an absolute nightmare getting a rote coordinator to sign off on you taking two days off work, for example. Another reason many doctors give for taking an F3 year is experience. If you're unsure about what you want to do, you have the opportunity to work in different specialties and gain experience and compare different specialties with each other. You can apply for different jobs, so you may spend three months in general surgery and you may spend three months in psychiatry if you can't decide between the two that's completely up to you and you can take that time to figure out what one suits you best before formalizing that and applying to specialty training. It also gives you the time to build up your CV a little bit. So you can do quality improvement projects or you can do audits or you can even do research papers and try and get your CV built up for a specific specialty. Following on from that education, as I just mentioned, it gives you the chance to study. If you take a bit of time away from training, you have more time to sit an exam. And if you sit an exam, some of these exams will help you with your application to specialty training. And because you have more time, you might get a better score because you have more chance to study and you can dictate when you work around your studying rather than your studying being dictated about when you're working as a foundation doctor. Also, you can start to build up your CV, as I said before, and show that you're committed to a specialty. You can also go back to university and do a course or do a part-time course to go alongside your work that you're doing as an F3 doctor. The fourth reason is money. And it's quite obvious if you're working as an F3 doctor, specifically as a locum, you earn a lot more money than you would do if you were in training. And the reason for this is because you're filling gaps at short notice and there's a significant shortage of doctors across the UK. And if you want to know how much you can earn working as a locum doctor, you can click on my video link up here because I've done quite a few videos talking about the money you can earn from working as a locum doctor. And if you want a video which specifically compares working as a locum doctor versus working as a foundation doctor, I'll link that up here again as well. But I guess in short, you can typically earn about three times the amount per hour you would as a locum doctor working at an SHO level than you would do as a foundation doctor or an F2 doctor working at an SHO level. And this might give you the chance to save up for a big expense like a house deposit or a car or a wedding. And it's probably something you've not really had the chance to do working as a foundation doctor. In saying that though, some doctors would prefer to go straight into specialty training and essentially get to the top of the ladder quicker because then you'll earn a bit more money that way. So for example, GP training is three years long. So if you go straight from foundation training to GP training, you're closer to becoming a fully qualified GP and then you'll earn a lot bit more money compared to a foundation doctor. Reason number five, travel. Many doctors use some of their F3 year to take some time off and go on holiday. During the foundation training program, as I mentioned before, you get nine days off per a four month rotation and it's a nightmare getting that time off. And this is often complicated by doing night shifts or staff shortages. So very rarely are you able to get a prolonged period of time away to go somewhere or wherever you want to go essentially. Doctors may also choose to work in places such as Australia and gain experience working in a different healthcare system during their F3 year. And some doctors may choose at this point to stay in these countries and apply for their specialty training programs. However, this isn't something I have any particular experience in, so I'm not as clued up on how to go about organizing time away from training to go work abroad. And there are plenty of videos on YouTube which do discuss this. Now moving on to what job roles are available for F3 doctors, and there's a whole wide range of them. But we'll start with the clinical fellow rule. And this is a relatively newish rule. It's sort of come about because there's a shortage of doctors at SHO level, and they know more doctors are choosing to take time away from training. So hospitals are trying to create these jobs to essentially entice F3 doctors back to working for their trust specifically. And essentially you work at the level of an ST1 in a specific specialty. And it's often to further your own experience in that specific specialty. So often they'll come with a small study budget that you can use for things like 
courses or maybe to do a postgraduate certificate in a specific subject and you're also offered the chance to be supervised by well basically have an educational supervisor and this can be quite useful if you've got to do an appraisal at the end of the year as well and because they'll be in the specific specialty that you're applying for they may offer you some support when applying as well as often being a reference for you when you're applying to whatever specialty you're interested in however there are some things to look out for if you are applying for a clinical fellow role number one read the job description read it again and again and again and again basically if you want to be a clinical fellow read the job description because the term clinical fellow doesn't actually mean that much the clinical fellow role varies widely depending on which trust you're applying for some will come with a study budget some will give you protected time to do audits or quality improvement projects some will give you protected time to go do courses or teach other medical students and things like that but the term clinical fellow is really ill-defined and you want to clarify what's going to be expected from you if you're taking up this role also some clinical fellow roles actually involve rotating which can be good if you're still undecided about what you want to do or you want to get different surgical experiences for example so you might go from orthopedics to urology to general surgery but if you know specifically what you want to do and you want to become integrated within one specific team and you want to stay in one specific specialty you need to check that out before you apply for the job the other important thing to consider is if you're working as a clinical fellow you're essentially a trust grade so if a hospital department is short staffed because you're employed directly by that hospital by that trust they're able to move you to a different specialty if they need you in a different specialty whereas training doctors do have a bit more protection because they're supposed to be training so they won't typically get moved to another specialty first although we all kind of know that that happens anyway regardless because there's such big staffing issues within the NHS the other important thing to consider is you need to define what's a clinical fellow and what's a clinical teaching fellow and which one you want to do because there is a bit of blurring between the two in the job descriptions clinical teaching fellows focus more on the education side and teaching medical students with clinical fellows focus more on experience in a specific specialty and it depends on what you want sometimes ads for certain jobs can be a bit misleading and if you're interested in being a clinical teaching fellow they can sort of make it clinical fellow roles look a bit more like a clinical teaching fellow role to sort of entice you to apply for them but they're not actually dedicated to teaching as such i guess moving on from that is the clinical teaching fellow role which we'll just discuss now as well these are job roles that tend to be much more focused on teaching and education it's kind of in the name most clinical teaching fellow jobs have a much higher percentage of teaching versus clinical work. For an example, some will involve 80% teaching time versus 20% clinical time. Now, if that's what you want, it can be really good. It can be a really good experience having this time dedicated to teaching and working with medical students and working often with a tie to a university. As part of this role, you may be asked to be a sort of go-between between between the hospital placements itself and the university. And often you'll find yourself organizing teaching sessions as well as being the sort of first port of call for students who are having any difficulties on their placement. Because of the focus on teaching, you may find that your clinical aspect to your job Job role is kind of an add-on so it's not particularly focused and you might find that you're not doing too much clinical work during this clinical teaching fellow year and often you'll either have one or two days within a hospital doing that sort of work and that's mainly just to keep up your clinical skills there's some tips for clinical teaching fellow job roles as i said before read the job description if you want a clinical teaching fellow job role make sure that you're going to get protected time to teach and as i said before a lot of clinical teaching job roles are 80 percent focused on teaching and 20 percent focused on clinical however there are some out there with a 50 50 split or there are some there with an 80 percent clinical split and 20 percent teaching split and it really depends on what you want but if you're more interested in the teaching i'd suggest increasing the percentage of teaching time versus the clinical time the other important thing to consider is a lot of clinical teaching fellow roles give you a study budget and you can use this to do postgraduate certificates in medical education or some courses that actually relate to teaching and it can help build up your CV a little bit as well. Also these job roles should come with an appraiser or an educational supervisor so again you should be able to get an appraisal done at the end of the year. So despite the fact that these job roles focus primarily on education and teaching you still get that experience of having an educational supervisor and in theory they should be helping you progress in whatever you want to progress in and if you are considering applying to specialty training at the end of the year they should be helping you with that as well another good thing to mention about having an educational supervisor is they should help you outline what you want to get out of the year with a pdp form for example at the beginning of the year so if you are doing a clinical teaching fellow job you should be trying to suss out what you want to achieve during that year working as a clinical teaching fellow but the one point i'm going to repeat here as well is make sure you define what a clinical fellow is versus a clinical teaching fellow and make sure you figure out which one you want to do and if you are going to apply for them make sure you apply for the correct one as i said before some of the job descriptions for both of them could be a bit misleading so make sure you're sure about what you're applying for now moving on to internal locuming this is when you sign up for an internal hospital bank and you have the opportunity to pick up shifts at short notice and they're often available due to sickness and vacancies and you get paid at locum rate as an internal locum you get paid slightly less than you would as an external locum but you'll have the first choice of jobs 
So the first place the hospital is going to go if they have short staffing or if they have some a vacancy available is you because you're slightly cheaper than an external locum. So you, like I said, you get first choice of job. And a lot of people internal locum at the place where they did their foundation training because you already have computer logins, you already have access to all the scan requests and all the rest of it and things like that. You also know the departments and you know the staff and it just makes it a lot easier. But as I said before, as an internal locum, you are likely to be paid less than an external locum and the rates are often non-negotiable. So the flip side to that is external locuming. And this is when you sign up for an agency and the agency will try and find you work. So it's their role to try and get you job. You'll be able to negotiate through the agency about how much you get paid per hour. However, whatever you ask the agency to charge for your hourly rate, the agency will then add another bit on top of that so they get paid by the hospital trust as well. So you're less likely to get long-term locum post because you're going to be charging more than an internal locum. You're also more likely to have to move about the country a little bit. So you may pick up jobs in different hospitals and move about a little bit more because you're going to be charging a bit more money to do work essentially. Some important things to consider if you are planning on locuming, sign up to agencies early on, make sure that you've done all the sort of background checks because they can take a while so you need to do your DBS checks and things like that. Start early essentially and sign up to a few different locum agencies that way you'll have a wider variety of work available to you. The other thing to consider is if you're planning on internal locuming in the hospital you're working as a foundation doctor you have to do all the paperwork again. Look if you have a different payroll number they'll make you do the DBS checks, they'll make you do all your mandatory training again so just make sure you get it all done before you August because that way you can start working as a locum as soon as August rolls around. If you're an F2 doctor and you're planning on locuming in the same trust, do all the mandatory training again right before you finish your foundation training, save all the certificates and then you can just send them all back in as an F3 doctor. That way you don't have to pay to do your mandatory training through a locum agency or through the internal locum bank. So basically even if it's not about to expire just do it all again right before you finish your foundation training because that way you can just use the certificates for your locum year. It's important to note as well some agencies will try try and charge you for mandatory training if you do it through them. So like I said, to save yourself a bit of money, do it right before you finish your F2 year and that way you won't have to pay that money. The other thing to point out by locuming is you don't have an appraiser, so you're gonna to have to go find one yourself. Often locum agencies will offer you someone to who will do your appraisals at the end of the year, which is good, but they're gonna charge you quite a bit of money and to give you an idea about how much it cost, mine cost £420 last year and the year before that I think it was about 300 so it does go up in price as well. However, some agencies will give you the appraisal free and find a consultant for you if you do so many hours by working through them because essentially the agency are taking a bit of money for on every hour you work essentially. Another important thing to consider is if you are planning and applying specialty training after your locum year, you're gonna to want to make sure you've got some references lined up, but you're also gonna need references to sign up for different agencies as well. So for example, each agency often wants at least two references to sign up through them. Say you sign up for three locum agencies, that's six references, plus the fact you're gonna to apply to specialty training later on that's another two references that's eight references if you keep using the same two consultants for all the references that you need to get they're going to get quite wound up because they have to fill out these forms each different agency they can't use the same form so you're basically going to be nagging the same consultants over and over again best thing you can do is get a few consultants who'd be willing to give you a reference and sort of split up the references you're sending them don't send four reference requests to the same consultant because it's just going to be a bit of a waste of their time they're going to have to keep doing the same thing over and over again and they're going to get a bit annoyed at you for doing that another important point of looking is keep track your pay slip and how many hours you've worked. You've worked in the NHS long enough now to know that there's always issues with pay slips and pay and it turns out that extends to low working as a locum too. Make sure the number of hours worked matches up with the amount you're getting paid and keep track of that and keep evidence of that as well. Another thing is try and sort out the fact you're going to be put on an emergency tax bracket as soon as you start working as a locum, so in August. So try and sort that out as soon as possible because you don't want to be emergency tax for multiple months because it will eat into your pay. I appreciate you'll get it back at the end of the year. It's a long time to be waiting from August to April to get that money back. Now another job role available to F3 doctors is working abroad and I'm by no means an expert on this and I've not done it myself and there's different videos out there which do discuss this in a lot more detail. What I do know is a really common destination for doctors to take an F3 year is Australia and New Zealand and they do hold recruitment drives so keep looking online for these potential jobs and basically just email different hospitals in Australia or New Zealand and see if they reply. Working in a different country gives you a chance to see a new healthcare system and just experience a different country and from my understanding you'll also need to apply for a registration to their medical council of whichever country you want to work in. Seeing that I don't have much experience in this and I don't want to give you any false information, there's other videos out there which do talk about this in a lot more detail and they probably have a lot more experience than I do. The other option you have when you finish your foundation training program is just take a break from medicine. Between the pandemic and now dealing with all the ongoing industrial action and all the negative media attention that doctors are now getting, simply from doing their job. It's not that surprising more and more doctors are choosing to take time or 
permanently leave working as a doctor. The simple fact that burnout was on the rise within the pre profession and taking some time away from training actually might be a really good thing. There's all sorts of things you can do outside of medicine and that's completely okay. After completing the foundation training program, it's the first time you've not really been on a contract and you now can basically do what you want for whatever better way of describing it. You can go try out working outside of healthcare. Even if it's just hitting pause and working in medicine for a little bit and you want to come back to it at a later date, that's absolutely fine too. But an F3 year is actually probably a really good opportunity to do this because like I said, you're no longer on a contract. Now moving on to things, just sort of tips and tricks that you need for your F3 year. Number one, you still need an appraisal. When you're in the foundation training program, this appraisal's fitted in at the end of the year in June usually as part of your ARCP and you don't need to get your appraisal sorted it's part of your foundation training program whereas working as an F3 doctor you need to make sure you get an appraisal at the end of the year there's rumours online saying you don't need an appraisal and there's ways to go about it but actually the simple thing is if you get an appraisal done it helps with your revalidation which you have to do at year five after graduating so the best advice I can give is just make sure you get an appraisal done at the end of each year you have out of training. And it's not an automatic process and there's no one going to be out there to remind you as there was in the foundation training program. So it's your responsibility to make sure that you get it done. And this is even more important if you're working as a locum because you don't opt automatically have an appraiser or an educational supervisor in your job role. So keep that in mind and keep trying to build up a portfolio that you will need part of your appraisal at the end of the year. And as part of that, you're going to want to continue showing that you're doing continuous professional development, so CPD. And if you've attended any Royal College events or lectures, or if you've been to any conferences, if you've attended any courses, these are all things you're going to want to keep evidence of and you can put it as part of your portfolio. Another thing to point out is all mandatory training counts towards your CPD. So every agency makes you do your mandatory training, as I said before. So if you keep the certificates for this, even like your online fire safety course, these all count as mandatory training and do build up your uh, CPD errors as well. So you can put them in your portfolio as well. And basically the reason you need to do an appraisal is because the GMC say so and to quote them, appraisal is a key part of revalidation. It should be developmental and insurance focused and it's not a pass or fail exercise. You must participate in appraisal every year unless there's a clear and reasonable mitigating circumstance that prevent you from doing so. Basically, just do your appraisal. Keep it very simple. If you do your appraisal, you can't go too wrong. The second point I want to make is there's a time limit on being out of training. Now, once you finish your foundation training, you can may think you can be out of training indefinitely. You can go on and become an FY15 if you want to. And theoretically, you can, that's fine. But the form that you get for finishing your F2 year, the FPCC form, so it's the Foundation Programme Certificate of Completion, is only valid for three and a half years. So that means if you want to go into specialty training in the future, you need an up-to-date form. So you need to make sure you start specialty training within the three and a half years, otherwise you've not got a valid certificate. There is a way around this and it's something that I've actually done, which is getting a crest form signed. This is when you get a consultant who's worked with you for a period of time to basically tick off and say that you're they're happy that you can work at an F2 level or an SHO level and you meet all the competencies of an F2 doctor. And I've got one of these forms signed as well, as well as my FPCC form. Tip number three, know when your application deadline is. So if you're out of training, it can be quite easy to get out of the training bubble. But if you're considering starting training the year after your F3 year, you're going to want to pay attention to when the training application is open and what you need to do for when you're applying. For example, if you're applying to the GP training program, you need to know when the application opens, but you also need to know when you need to set your MSRA examination. And you're going to need to know when you need to start revising for this exam in good time. The last thing you want to do is aim to start training the year after doing an F3 year and miss all the deadlines so you have to take another year out of training when you didn't plan on doing so. The way around this is just to make sure you mark down the deadlines early on and keep reminding yourself that this is coming up you need to get this sorted and apply to specialty training if it's what you want to do. Tip number four, figure out why you want to take time away from training and I'd argue that if there's one thing to take away from this is figure out what you're doing in your F3 year. It can be really easy to go, right, I've finished my foundation training. I want to work as a locum doctor. You start working as a locum doctor, doing some random odd shifts in general medicine, and you earn a bit more money and you have a bit more free time. And that's great, but then what? If it's your aim to earn a bit more money and have a bit more free time, well, great, you're meeting what you want to do, so that's fine. But I started quickly realizing when I started working as a locum that I didn't actually know what I was aiming for. Why exactly had I chosen to take time out of training? If you can figure out why you're choosing to take time out of training early on, it can help you get the most out of that year or couple of years, depending on how long you plan on taking out of training. But try and ask yourself some questions. Do you want to get more experience in one specific specialty? Do you feel ready to start training yet? These are all questions that you can ask yourself and it'll help you get the most out of your year. More generally, it's really really easy to aimlessly just work and then you won't get the most out of your time away from training. If you have an idea about why you're taking time away from training, it can help you figure out what you want to get out of it. So if you've made it this far and I appreciate this is quite a rambly video, 
I'll summarize what I've basically been talking about. More and more doctors have taken time away from training and it's essentially become the new normal. Somewhat ironically goes against what Sir Liam Donaldson's original plan was for the foundation training program. There's lots of different reasons why doctors choose to take this time away from training but and it's likely personal but there are quite a few common reasons out there. Things like flexibility, money, chance to take a time away from working medicine, there's all sorts of reasons out there. But arguably my main take home point from this rambly video is think about why you specifically want to take time out of training because that'll help you get the most of your F3 year. Hopefully you found this video useful. I appreciate it. it's a very rambly, long-winded video but it was just something I'd done a teaching session on recently and I just thought I'd turn it into a video as well. It is quite in-depth as well. If you have liked this video and if you have made it this far, please subscribe to my channel and thanks for watching and I'll see you in my next video.